at the end of the day, who are you really working for? The banks. Money is created in a bank and invariably ends up in a bank. They are the true masters, along with the corporations and governments they support. Physical slavery requires people to be housed and fed. Economic slavery requires people to feed and house themselves. It is one of the most ingenious scams for social manipulation ever created and at its core it is an invisible war against the population. Debt is the weapon used to conquer and enslave societies and interest is its prime ammunition. And as the majority walks around oblivious to this reality, the banks in collusion with governments and corporations continue to perfect and expand their tactics of economic warfare, spawning new bases such as the World Bank and International Monetary Fund, while also inventing a new type of soldier, the birth of the economic hitman. We economic hitmen really have been the ones responsible for creating this first truly global empire. And we work many different ways. But perhaps the most common is that we will identify a, a country that has resources our corporations covet, like oil, and then arrange a huge loan to that country from the World Bank or one of its sister organizations. But the money never actually goes to the country. Instead, it goes to our big corporations to build infrastructure projects in that country, power plants, industrial parks, ports, things that benefit a few rich people in that country, in addition to our corporations, but really don't help the majority of the people at all. However, those people, the whole country is left holding a huge debt. It's such a big debt they can't repay it, and that's part of the plan that they can't repay it. And so at some point, we economic hitmen go back to them and say, listen, you lost a lot of money, can't pay your debt, so sell your oil real cheap to our oil companies. Allow us to build a military base in your country or send troops in support of ours to some place in the world like Iraq or vote with us on the next UN vote to have their electric utility company privatized and their water and sewage system privatized and sold to U.S. corporations or other multinational corporations. So there was that whole mushrooming thing and it's so typical of the way the IMF and the World Bank work that you put a country in debt, it's such a big debt it can't pay it, and then you offer to refinance that debt and, and, and pay even more interest. And you demand this quid pro quo, which you call a conditionality or good governance, which means basically that they've got to sell off their resources, including many of their social services, their utility companies, their school systems sometimes, their, their, their penal systems, their insurance systems to foreign corporations. So it's a, it's a double, triple, quadruple whammy. And in that way, we've really created an empire, but we've done it very, very subtly. It's clandestine. All the empires of the past were built on the military, and everybody knew they were building them. So the, the British knew they were building them, the French, the Germans, the, the Romans, the, the Greeks, and they were proud of it. And they always had some excuse like spreading civilization, spreading some religion, something like that. But they, they knew they were doing it. We don't. The majority of the people in the United States have no idea that we're living off the benefits of a clandestine empire that today there's more slavery in the world than ever before. And then you have to ask yourself, well, if it's, if it's an empire, then who's the emperor? Obviously, uh, our presidents of the United States are not emperors. An emperor is someone who's not elected, doesn't serve a limited term, and doesn't report to anyone, essentially. So you can't classify our presidents that way. But we do have what I consider to be the equivalent of the emperor, and it's what I call the corporatocracy. Corporatocracy is this group of individuals who run our biggest corporations, and they really act as the emperor of this empire. Um, they control our media, either through direct ownership or advertising. They control most of our uh, politicians because they finance their campaigns, either through their corporations or through personal contributions that come out of the corporations. They're not elected, 
They don't serve a limited term, they don't report to anybody. And at the very top of the corporatocracy, you really can't tell whether a person's working for a private corporation or the government because they're always moving back and forth. So, you know, you've got a guy who one moment is the president of, uh, of a big construction company like Halliburton, and, and, and the next moment he's vice president of the United States, or the president who was in the oil business. And, and this is true whether you've got Democrats or Republicans in the office. You have the moving back and forth through the revolving door. And in a way, um, our government is, is invisible a lot of the time, and its policies are carried out by our corporations on one level or another. And then again, the policies of the government are basically forged by the corporatocracy and then presented to the government, they become government policy. So it's an incredibly cozy relationship. This isn't a conspiracy theory type of thing. These people don't have to get together and, and plot to do things. They all basically work under one primary assumption, and that is that they must maximize profits regardless of the social and environmental costs. This process of manipulation by the corporatocracy through the use of debt, bribery, and political overthrow is called globalization. Just as the Federal Reserve keeps the American public in a position of indentured servitude through perpetual debt, inflation, and interest, the World Bank and IMF serve this role on a global scale. The basic scam is simple. Put a country in debt, either by its own indiscretion or through corrupting the leader of that country, then impose conditionalities or structural adjustment policies, often consisting of the following. Currency devaluation. When the value of a currency drops, so does everything valued in it. This makes indigenous resources available to predator countries at a fraction of their worth. Large funding cuts for social programs. These usually include education and healthcare compromising the well-being and integrity of the society, leaving the public vulnerable to exploitation. Privatization of state-owned enterprises. This means that socially important systems can be purchased and regulated by foreign corporations for profit. For example, in 1999, the World Bank insisted that the Bolivian government sell the public water system of its third largest city to a subsidy of the U.S. corporation Bechtel, as soon as this occurred, water bills for the already impoverished local residents skyrocketed. It wasn't until after a full-blown revolt by the people that the Bechtel contract was nullified. Then there is trade liberalization, or the opening up of the economy through removing any restrictions on foreign trade. This allows for a number of abusive economic manifestations such as transnational corporations bringing in their own mass-produced products, undercutting the indigenous production and ruining local economies. An example is Jamaica, which, after accepting loans and conditionalities from the World Bank, lost its largest cash crop markets due to competition with Western imports. Today, countless farmers are out of work, for they are unable to compete with the large corporations. Another variation is the creation of numerous, seemingly unnoticed, unregulated, inhumane sweatshop factories, which take advantage of the imposed economic hardship. Additionally, due to production deregulation, environmental destruction is perpetual, as a country's resources are often exploited by the indifferent corporations, while outputting large amounts of deliberate pollution. The largest environmental lawsuit in the history of the world today is being brought on behalf of 30,000 Ecuadorian Amazonian people against Texaco, which is now owned by Chevron. So today it's against Chevron, but for activities conducted by Texaco. Estimated to be more than 18 times what the Exxon Valdez dumped into the coast of Alaska. In the case of Ecuador, it wasn't an accident. The oil companies did it intentionally. They knew they were doing it to save money out there rather than, rather than arranging for a proper disposal. Furthermore, a cursory glance at the performance record of the World Bank reveals that the institution, which publicly claims to help poor countries develop and alleviate poverty, has done nothing but increase poverty and the wealth gap, while corporate profits soar. In 1960, the income gap between the fifth of the world's people and the richest countries versus the fifth in the poorest countries was 30 to 1. 
by 1998, it was 74 to 1. While global GNP rose 40% between 1970 and 1985, those in poverty actually increased by 17%. While from 1985 to 2000, those living on less than $1 a day increased by 18%. Even the Joint Economic Committee of the U.S. Congress admitted that there is a mere 40% success rate of all World Bank projects. In the late 1960s, the World Bank intervened in Ecuador with large loans. During the next 30 years, poverty grew from 50% to 70%. Under or unemployment grew from 15 to 70%. Public debt increased from 240 million to 16 billion while the share of resources allocated to the poor went from 20% to 6%. In fact, by the year 2000, 50% of Ecuador's national budget had to be allocated for paying its debts. It is important to understand the World Bank is, in fact, a U.S. bank, supporting U.S. interests. For the United States holds veto power over decisions as it is the largest provider of capital. And where did it get this money? You guessed it. It made it out of thin air through the fractional reserve banking system. Of the world's top 100 economies, as based on annual GDP, 51 are corporations, and 47 of that 51 are US based. Walmart, General Motors, and Exxon are more economically powerful than Saudi Arabia, Poland, Norway, South Africa, Finland, Indonesia, and many others. And, as protective trade barriers are broken down, currencies tossed together and manipulated in floating markets, and state economies overturned in favor of open competition and global capitalism, the empire expands. You get up on your little 21-inch screen and howl about America and democracy. There is no America. There is no democracy. There is only IBM and ITT and AT&T and DuPont, Dow, Union Carbide and Exxon. Those are the nations of the world today. What do you think the Russians talk about in their councils of state? Karl Marx? They get out their linear programming charts Statistical decision theories, minimax solutions, and compute the price cost probabilities of their transactions and investments, just like we do. We no longer live in a world of nations and ideologies, Mr. Beale. The world is a college of corporations, inexorably determined by the immutable bylaws of business. The world is a business, Mr. Beale. is being taken over by a handful of business powers who dominate the natural resources we need to live while controlling the money we need to obtain these resources. The end result will be world monopoly based not on human life but financial and corporate power. And as the inequality grows naturally more and more people are becoming desperate. So the establishment was forced to come up with a new way to deal with anyone who challenges the system. So they gave birth to the terrorist. The term terrorist is an empty distinction, designed for any person or group who chooses to challenge the establishment. This isn't to be confused with the fictional Al-Qaeda, which was actually the name of a computer database for the US-supported Mujahideen in the 1980s.
In 2007, the Department of Defense received $161.8 billion for the so-called global war on terrorism. According to the National Counterterrorism Center, in 2004, roughly 2,000 people were killed internationally due to supposed terrorist acts. Of that number, 70 were American. Using this number as a general average, which is extremely generous, it is interesting to note that twice as many people die from peanut allergies a year than from terrorist acts. Concurrently, the leading cause of death in America is coronary heart disease, killing roughly 450,000 each year. And in 2007, the government's allocation of funds for research on this issue was about $3 billion. This means that the US government in 2007 spent 54 times the amount for preventing terrorism than it spent for preventing a disease which kills 6,600 times more people annually than terrorism does. Yet, as the name terrorism and Al-Qaeda are arbitrarily stamped on every news report relating to any action taken against U.S. interests, the myth grows wider. In mid-2008, the U.S. Attorney General actually proposed that the U.S. Congress officially declare war against the fantasy. Not to mention, as of July 2008, there are now over one million people currently on the U.S. terrorist watch list. These so-called counterterrorism measures, of course, have nothing to do with social protection and everything to do with preserving the establishment amongst the growing anti-American sentiment both domestically and internationally, which is legitimately founded on the greed-based corporate empire expansion that is exploiting the world. The true terrorists of our world do not meet at the docks at midnight or scream Allah Akbar before some violent action. The true terrorists of our world wear $5,000 suits and work in the highest positions of finance, government, and business. So, what do we do? How do we stop a system of greed and corruption that has so much power and momentum? How do we stop this aberrant group behavior which feels no compassion for, say, the millions slaughtered in Iraq and Afghanistan, so the corporatocracy can control energy resources and opium production for Wall Street profit? How do we stop a system of greed and corruption that condemns poor populations to sweatshop slavery for the benefit of Madison Avenue? Or that engineers false flag terror attacks for the sake of manipulation? Or that generates built-in modes of social operation which are inherently exploitative? Or that systematically reduces civil liberties and violates human rights in order to protect itself from its own shortcomings? How do we deal with the numerous covert institutions such as the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, and the Bilderberg Group, and other undemocratically elected groups which, behind closed doors, collude to control the political, financial, social, and environmental elements of our lives? In order to find the answer, we must first find the true underlying cause. For the fact is, the selfish, corrupt, power and profit based groups are not the true source of the problem. They are symptoms. <laughs>